Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I'm honored to introduce this virtual event with Helen Scales, presenting her latest book, The Brilliant Abyss, exploring the majestic hidden life of the deep ocean and the looming threat that imperils it, in conversation with Christina M. Jardy. I hope everyone's week is going well. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. This is our last event of the year, but we'll be back in January with more exciting programming. To stay in the loop about our upcoming talks, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. We also have a Science Research Public Lectures YouTube channel. We can view previous talks that you might have missed, and I'll be sharing the link for that in the chat shortly. Tonight's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase The Brilliant Abyss on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you to all of you for showing up and tuning in for authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and especially for science. The impact of your support this year can't be overstated and we are truly grateful. And finally, as you may have experienced in previous virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Helen Scales, PhD, is a marine biologist, writer, and public broadcaster. She is the author of Spirals in Time, The Secret Life and Curious Afterlife of Seashells, and Eye of the Shoal, A Fish Watcher's Guide to Life, the Ocean, and Everything. She has written for National Geographic, The Guardian, New Scientist, BBC Wildlife Magazine, and BBC Focus, among others. And she also presents the Earth Unscrewed podcast. She teaches marine biology and science writing at Cambridge University and advises the marine conservation charity Sea Changers. Christina M. Jardy is Senior High Seas Advisor to IUCN's Global Marine and Polar Program, an adjunct professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, California, where she teaches international maritime or marine law. For the past 30 years, Christina has focused on the nexus of the law, science, and policy relating to sustaining marine biodiversity and authored or co-authored over 150 publications, many with leading ocean scientists. In addition to her work advancing in U new UN Treaty for Marine Life Beyond Boundaries, Christina co-founded and currently serves on four science policy partnerships, including the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative. Christina is also a member of the Interim Advisory Board of the UN Decade of Ocean Science, an advisor to the Schmidt Ocean Institute, and an honorary fellow of the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh. Tonight, they'll be discussing Helen's latest book, The Brilliant Abyss, in which she illuminates the darkest depths of our planet's oceans, detailing its improbable, beautiful, and freaky denizens, its critical importance to surface life, and the risks we run if we choose to exploit its wealth of untapped resources. Cy Montgomery calls it mind-blowing, writing, Helen Scales blitzes us again and again with the deep sea's staggering strangeness and arresting beauty. Studded with wonder on every page, the brilliant abyss is proof that even as we consume and ruin our beautiful earth in our greed, we hardly know our planet at all. At this critical point in human history, Scales' eloquent reporting underscores the urgency with which we must, we must focus on saving the deep sea if our planet is to survive. Without further ado, I'm so excited to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Helen and Christina. Thank you so much. That was a lovely introduction and thank you everyone for coming. It's uh, really wonderful to be here. Just going to organize that. So shall I dive straight in and uh, begin with what I want to start with actually is just um, how I begin the book. Um, which is to give you all a bit of a glimpse of the extraordinary life forms that we find down in the deep ocean, while at the same time, hopefully giving you a bit of an idea, um, well, helping, I guess, to wrap your heads around just how big the deep ocean is, because that size um, factor is a really important um, 
thing that influences what we see down in the deep ocean and why life down there is so strange and different to what we see out on land, simply because of its enormous size. And it's really hard to wrap your head around that. Um, so I'm hopefully going to give you a bit of a hand uh, just in the next few minutes. So I'm just going to share my screen and um, show you some pictures of some of the wonderful things we see as well. So um, what I want you to do is imagine that we are all going to sail I climb on board a beautiful um, luxury yacht. I'm going to sail offshore um, to somewhere above some very deep ocean water. And uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to drop this marble, this glass marble um, into the over the side of the boat. And it's going to fall down in, through the layers of the deep ocean. And we're going to follow that marble on its journey down through the deep and past some of the things that it's going to see on the way. And as I say, hopefully this will help introduce what's there and give you an idea of, of just what we're talking about in terms of the deep sea. So for the first seven minutes, our marble is going to pass through the sunlit zone. So this is the, the upper part of the ocean, uh, the part that we know the best, the part where the sun still shines. And it's going to be about seven minutes falling down uh, through this sunlit zone. And then it will enter the deep sea proper. Uh, and that's at around 660 feet. Um, and we enter the first kind of zone of the deep, which is what we call the twilight zone. Now, this um, is a, a, during the day, it's a beautiful deep blue color. Just imagine as if you were going outside at night, uh, just as the sun has set, maybe on a clear evening, and you look up and you see that deep inky uh, color in the sky. And it's it's that sort of color um, throughout the twilight zone um, and getting darker as you go down uh, through the daylight, uh, through the daytime. and. The key thing about um, that change of depth from that 660 mark is that there's not enough sunlight left for plants to grow, for plant life, for any kind of photosynthesis to happen. So no new food is being made. And that's a key challenge to life in the deep is finding enough food. Um, but you do see all sorts of wonderful creatures like this Dumbo octopus um, swimming around in the twilight zone. It's one of the many creatures that live in the deep open waters that never know a hard surface in their lifetimes. So they're constantly swimming and floating around, in this case with those big flaps that look a bit like ears, but they're not. They're just uh, an extension of their bodies, but it helps them to swim around. We also see enormous shoals of things like lanternfish. Um, which are the most, uh, we think, the most abundant vertebrates on the planet, hiding down in the twilight zone. And so much more life is, is coursing around in these waters. And our marble is going to drop down through the twilight zone for um, about half an hour. That's how long it takes to get through that depth. And then it will enter the next zone, which is the midnight zone. Now, this is where there's no sunlight at all from um, around about the 3,300 3, feet mark. And um, but it's not completely dark down there because actually a lot of the animal life that we see down in the midnight zone and all the way through the water column actually is able to make its own light. It's bioluminescent. It's almost um, it's almost compulsory to be bioluminescent. It's something like 75 percent of the species of animal life that are found in the open water in the deep sea can make their own light. Um, things like these beautiful gossamer worms. And um, this uh, the yellow one here and at the top and the red one down here are both types of gossamer worm and they swim through the water with this elegant pirouettes. They're incredibly agile and um, they swim forwards and backwards. They spin in circles. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and this guy on the other side is called a swimmer worm. Hopefully you can see that um, it's good at swimming. That's why they called it the swimmer worm. Um, and uh, all of these are, are true glowing worms. Um, unlike the glow worms on land, which are actually mostly types of beetle, these ones really are worms and they really do glow. Um, and we think mostly what they're doing is using their um, lights that they sort of throw these sparkles into the water as a form of um, defense. So if they're being attacked by a predator or if they get scared, they can do this and hopefully startle that attacker and um, gives them time to slip away um, into the dark. So um, you might actually just be able to make out um, on this worm here, these these um, green um, orbs that it has. And they, he, they basically throw those into the water like little bombs and they explode into light. And then and then hopefully the worm gets a chance to disappear. So there's a lot of sparkling lights amongst a lot of the animals that live um, in the deep ocean in the midnight zone. There are sparkling bioluminescent fish and octopuses and squid and shrimp. All sorts of things are making light down there for all sorts of reasons. And, and, and it kind of makes sense if you live in a world where there's no sunlight and it's permanently midnight then being able to make and control your own light is really useful. It means that you can communicate with others. You can hopefully you know, dissuade predators from eating you, things like that. So it's a really useful thing to happen. And we see it so, so much 
um, through this uh, deep water space um, in this, in this uh, permanent midnight zone down in the deep. And our marble is going to spend about another hour and a half falling down through the midnight zone, all the way past these glittering, glowing creatures as it goes down. Um, then it's going to reach the zone which oceanographers generally refer to as the abyssal zone. Now, the word abyss, as in the title of the book, is, is quite a general term that's been used. I talk about it in the book about the sort of different meanings of that word and when it was first applied um, to the ocean. But now we kind of generally think about it as being um, this sort of next zone down below the midnight zone. And it's where um, the pressure is really starting to ramp up here. I mean, it's getting ridiculously high pressure down here. So we're sort of talking about um, the equivalent of having an elephant, an, an African elephant standing on every square inch of your body. I mean, such high pressure that, it, you know, our, our cells simply wouldn't function um, if, uh, if we were to live, if we were to go down there. And yet what we see living in the deep, which is kind of strange and surprising, are lots of creatures like these ones, which are quite delicate looking. And the various different types of jellyfish and relatives of jellyfish, things like siphonophores. You'll actually see a beautiful siphonophore in Christina's um, picture right now, which is one of the longest animals that have ever been found. It's, I think, about 150 feet long. And it's a siphonophore that was found off Australia, really cool picture. All of these are really delicate jelly based creatures. And again, it seems kind of strange. Why would in this crushing pressure of the depth do we see such delicate creatures? But again, it kind of makes sense. Um, jelly is actually quite a good, it's quite good under pressure. So actually that's, that's not too bad. And crucially, it's also a very cheap material to make a body from. And as well as the high pressure, there's very little food. Food is getting more and more scarce as you go down, generally as you go down in the deep ocean. So if you can find a way to evolve life that's pretty cheap and doesn't require a lot of energy, then that's going to be great. And so we think that's one reason why you get a lot of these really intricate um, but delicate creatures made of jelly in, in the abyssal zone and all the way through the deep, in fact. And, um, and what they're eating, a lot of these things, is, are basically particles that fall down from above called marine snow. You can see these little white flecks in this picture caught in the camera light. Um, it sounds really lovely. Um, it's, it's not as nice as it sounds. Marine snow is mostly dead plankton and little creatures from the surface seas, as well as their poop that stick together in clumps and drop down into the deep sea. And then various creatures, including these all sorts of jelly creatures and jellyfish, uh, are basically catching that snow on its way down to the bottom of the sea. And that's where they get their food. So it's an incredibly important source of food for the deep ocean, but it's a very thin source of food. It's at, at most around about 2% of the food made in the surface seas will get down into the deep ocean and provide um, this source of food is in terms of snow. And it gets less and less as you go down because all sorts of animals are catching that snow. There's jellyfish. Um, there are creatures like this vampire squid, which looks, what well, sounds terrifying, looks pretty scary, actually is a very gentle, slow creature that basically catches snow. They have these long filaments which they pay out into the water. These particles of um, marine snow settle down onto that. Then they, they reel them back in and then pack that snow into little balls and then eat, eat them. And that's how they survive down in the deep ocean. Um, so anything that can make life um, more efficient and less energy hungry basically is going to be a good thing if you're living down in these greatest depths of the ocean. And so the marble is going to keep going down. It, depending on exactly where we are, it could by this point start landing on the seabed and it might end up alongside some of these other weird and wonderful creatures that live down in the deep. Here's a bathysaurus, a kind of fish that generally sits down on the bottom of the sea with some rather impressive looking teeth. Um, here's another fish looking rather surprised, um, a type of toadfish. Um, this guy's one of my favorites. This is a hungry scale worm. Well, that's the common name we give them. And this one was actually named after Elvis Presley because of all those beautiful sequins, of course, um, that Elvis liked to wear himself. And these guys are actually pretty feisty. You might see they've got little bits. This one has rather got some chunks taken out of its sequins. And, and that was probably from fights with other scale worms. Um, they are very territorial and will basically throw punches at each other and try and take out bites of each other if they're in the wrong place. Um, but they are incredibly uh, beautiful creatures. Now, um, again, depending on where we are, there's a chance the marble might land on the side of one of hundreds of thousands of giant underwater mountains. There are sea mounts all the way through the deep ocean. They're basically volcanoes that don't reach the surface. They can be active, they can be um, dormant. Um, and uh, 
they are hard to find because they don't they don't um, come above the, the sea surface. So um, this is a map using um, it's been uh, had um, sonar basically used to map the, the topography of this sea this seamount, and that's a really great way of finding them. And, and they're really important habitat for all sorts of different types of species, but in particular, a lot of them are covered in corals. Now you might think of corals as being uh, well, they are the animals that build reefs like the Great Barrier Reef and in, uh, in Florida Keys, places like that. Um, but around half, more than half of the coral species we know of actually live down in the deep ocean. And, and there's really important habitats on seamounts. They're, they kind of form almost sort of gardens or, or, or forests of these animal made um, structures. There are sponges in there as well as corals. All sorts of other animals are kind of living on and among these these really intricate and beautiful um, organisms. That orange spongy thing down in the the bottom left hand right hand side that that is a sponge. The others are corals. Um, yeah, and there's lots of animals that live in and among these creatures. Um, so starfish, and brittle stars, and crabs and things are all living in this this animal made forest. Um, so those are habitats that we find all the way through the deep ocean in various places. Um, another place, again, depending where we are, possibly the marble might land um, in a hydrothermal vent. If it did, I'm not sure what would happen. These are probably the most extreme places on the planet. Um, they're the kind of deep sea equivalent of hot springs on land, only way more extreme. They get to hundreds of degrees. Um, they're full of toxic chemicals and metals. Um, and yet they're a complete oasis of life for all sorts of species. Um, something like eight out of 10 of them that live on vents don't live anywhere else. And there are hundreds that we're finding living on these incredible structures. They're also, many of them are known as black smokers. They form these big tall chimneys. And yeah, you can see in this picture here, there are some um, pale colored shrimp and crabs. Um, some of my favorite animals that live on hydrothermal vents are the scaly foot snails. These are from the Indian Ocean. They have these weird feet um, that you don't see anything, any other snails with feet like this. Their, their shells are made of iron, again, completely strange and rare that we find them doing this. Um, another of my favorites, which I write about in the book, are these guys, hoff crabs. They um, uh, they can form these really dense um, aggregations, as you can see in that picture. They're literally just hundreds of them all, all cl clustered around this black smoker. And they're called hoff crabs because they have um, a hairy chest and there are um, bacteria that they grow that, that feed on the chemicals in the water. Um, and that's how the, the crabs get their food. And, and it, was, it was David Hasselhoff, was what the scientists, who the scientists were thinking of uh, as this hairy chested uh, crabs that they found. Um, so, so there is a chance that our, you know, that our marble might land on, on, a, on a next to, perhaps next to a hoff crab. Now, if I'm very um, good with my aim, and if we are in the right part of the world, there is a chance the marble could land in the very deepest parts of the ocean. Now, I don't know if I can't see the numbers on my screen. I don't know if you can, but this is the Mariana Trench, um, the deepest trench um, in the ocean. And uh, I think oh, I can't, I'm, my face is currently over the numbers, so I can't see them, but I think it's something like 23,000 feet that this, this, this fish was um, filmed at. This is a snail fish, the most pressure proof fish um, vertebrate in the world. And they do perfectly fine um, because they've got these incredible adaptations for living at ridiculously high pressures. Um, this pink pudgy fish is not perhaps what you'd imagine living down in the deep ocean. It's always normally about angler fish with big teeth, but this is really the, the, uh, the emperors of the deep ocean of these guys. And there are different species in different trenches. This one happens to be in the Mariana Trench called Mariana Snailfish. And they're pretty amazing animals for their just ability to live at this ridiculously extreme depth. And and yeah, and if my if, if we got there, if we were out in the Pacific, and I managed to get the marble to fall to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, it would take in total six and a half hours to reach the bottom. It's it's a ridiculously long way down, and this that's sort of my idea of hoping to get you to wrap your head around the fact that the deep ocean. Um, is the, the single biggest living space on our planet. It's 95% of the biosphere, the space for animals to live is the deep ocean. Because not only is it um, that deep, which is around 6.8 miles to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, um, the volume is absolutely colossal as well. So if the ocean was to be filled up by the Amazon River pouring into it, that's not how it happened, but let's just imagine for a while that it did, it would take the Amazon 150,000 years to fill up the deep ocean. That's how much water it contains. And as we've seen, it, it there's life all the way down. And we're still finding so much more out about uh, what lives all the way through the water column and across the seabed down in the deep. And I'll just finish with this picture. This is the, the end papers actually of the book. Um, so just inside uh, the covers um, by the brilliant artist Aaron John Gregory um, based in California, who's this, who's given us this sort of artist rendition of what the seabed looks like with all these various features showing that there's this huge range of geology and geography and, and a huge range of biology as well down at the bottom of the sea. And there's still um, so much for us to discover. So 
thank you very much. And that was, yeah, my introduction to, to the wonders of the deep and um, hopefully gets you excited about uh, what's down there, as well as what's on my shirt as well. I hope you appreciate that I'm, I'm definitely dressed for the occasion. <laughs> I'm so jealous. That was, um, but Helen, thank you so much for that miraculous depiction of the, the life and um, marvels uh, of the deep. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited about this opportunity to sort of question you, and I'm sure there's many who are very envious about my position here, and I'm hoping they'll have a chance to ask some questions at the end of this session. Um, but I'd like to sort of transition us from the wonders of the deep and utilize uh, Robert Moore's quote from the uh, New York Times book review, which turned up on my birthday front page, beautiful illustration of bringing the deep sea to public life. Uh, he said, scale's great gift is for transmuting our awe at the wonders of the deep sea into a kind of quiet rage that they could soon be no more. Why should we care? Oh, it's such a lovely quote that um, the quiet rage really summed it up for me as well. Actually, he really na nailed that because that is what I've been feeling for a long time. And I think, you know, that's um, one thing I tried to get across in the book. Why should we care? I mean, the, aside from, well, I guess um, one reason, well, everything I've just said, you know, that the ocean, the deep ocean is so much of life on Earth. If we want to get to know what life is and what is possible, what life can do, then we have to look to the deep ocean. Um, we can't possibly understand what life can be without looking there, simply because of this huge portion of the living space is the deep. And also there's so many different solutions to the challenges of life are being, are being tried out in the deep ocean, whether it's a hoff crab with its strange form of, of getting energy from chemicals, in the water and everything else on hydrothermal vents um, through to those pressure proof fish and everything else you know like the deep is really showing us so much about what life can be and, and what can happen that it's not only showing us about life on earth but i think it's also inspiring ideas of what could be happening elsewhere in the universe if there is life out there this is giving us ideas of all the kind of crazy wonderful things that it can do right um so i think that's one reason but then there are lots of other and I, you know, the book also kind of progresses into um, talking about the various, um, I guess there are services, there are things that the, the deep ocean does for us as humanity is for the rest of life on Earth that we maybe, well, we're only really just learning about. So I'd say it's, it's hard to know, you know, how well understood that is we're still kind of just getting there but there's lots of reasons why the fact that our our planet is a water planet and it has so much water on it that um is making life it life on earth possible for everything else um so just as a few examples things like well all the extra heat that we're trapping on earth because of um all the greenhouse gases we're putting into the atmosphere as uh, human beings around about 90 percent of that extra heat is ending up in the ocean and i think around a fifth of it is going down into the deep ocean already it's really going down in there and if it wasn't for all that water, if we took that all away, I think we'd suddenly have something like a 30 degree increase. That's degrees Celsius, so it'd be probably more in Fahrenheit. But anyway, a huge, like ridiculously unbearable version of climate change would be happening if it wasn't for the oceans. And um, the oceans already uh, also, the deep is also drawing huge amounts of carbon down. Um, and we're still um, unpicking exactly uh, how that is um, serving, again, the, the whole climate system. So, you know, if, if from that point of view, we're, at, we're so reliant on this functioning and healthy functioning of the deep ocean just to make the planet somewhere where we can live and where so, many, so much else can live. Um, but that's, you know, I guess that's sort of two ends of the sort of trying to convince mm. you from the look, just because it's wonderful and we need to know side to, to we really can't do without it side as well. Um, yeah. But what you've described, the deep ocean is so remote. I mean, it takes six and a half hours for a marble to get down there. What exactly is threatening the, the deep sea? Um, what is um, past, present and future of some of these issues? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think that's part of the reason why it's hard to imagine that there can be any threats, because I guess for as long as um, we've people have kind of wondered about the ocean. We, there's been this lingering idea that it's so big that it can be untouchable. You know, it's, it's impossible to break the ocean because it's, it's too big for us to even scratch that. But unfortunately, as I explore in the book, um, there are lots of ways we have been doing that. Humanity has been doing that for a long time and new ways that we're, hope we're planning to do new things to the deep ocean. Um, so I guess for the longest time, 
either deliberately or accidentally the deep ocean has been or the ocean in, as a whole has been a repository for the stuff we don't want anymore um so there's been a long time that the deep ocean was seen that the kind of resource that was being exploited if you like in the deep ocean was the space that it, it, it provides just to put things we don't want anymore so um for a long there was a, a big long program of dumping chemical weapons in the deep ocean thinking that was a safe place to put them that's now coming back around as we're realizing people are realizing that that was not such like a smart plan um uh, other kinds of just hazardous wastes as well as just kind of everyday stuff, you know, dumping sewage in the ocean was a regular occurrence until really not that long ago. Um, off of New York, there was this um, dump site, 106, I, was, I write about in the book, where I think up until the 80s, it was just pretty regular occurrence just to load up ships full of human sewage, drive them offshore and just tip them in the sea. All done nicely out of the way, no one has to worry about it anymore. Um, and that's besides everything else that's just kind of getting into the ocean anyway, without us putting it there. And of course, now that is things like plastic pollution. And of course, plastic pollution is getting into the deep ocean. How could it not? Plastic fragments are everywhere. It's in our air, it's in our water, it's in our bodies. Of course, it's getting into the deep ocean. And in some places, in really scary proportions, like um, we are we finding um really sort of high concentrations possibly stirred up by currents in parts of the mediterranean where um the pages of an open book would have around about a hundred thousand scraps of plastic on that area of seabed would have a hundred thousand pieces on this just astonishing um but maybe not su maybe not surprising that's we should just you know of course it's stuff that's gonna it's gonna fall down the marine snow is getting infiltrated with plastic particles that's getting down there into the deep um so there's that side of things, the kind of pollution is hap has happened for a long time and is continuing. The exploitation of the deep is something I, I write about a lot in the book as well. And we are now seeing a kind of deepening of fishing. Um, there have been particular cases of fishing on seamounts. Um, I introduced those amazing habitats to you in the beginning. And um, uh, a particular story I write about in the book is the orange ruffy. Um, which is a fish that very little was known about until it was discovered to, to aggregate in huge, huge numbers on seamounts, um, kind of in, in the 70s, early 80s, into the 90s. And technology was coming online at that point to be able to find seamounts with sort of sonar and GPS, things like that, and also the kinds of fishing equipment that were going to allow fishing boats to, to actually operate at these sorts of depths. We're talking about at least a sort of um, a kind of um, a kilometer or so underwater. Um, and so this fish was found and it was exploited in just astonishing numbers. I mean, the, the, the industrial scale of this type of fishing was is really qu quite astonishing. I mean, it was 50 tons of fish in one net sometimes, so many that the nets would break. They're called orange ruffies because their skin is rough and their scales are rough and they would actually abrade the nets and they could break and it would all fall down to the seabed and that would be that. Um, so that has happened and we saw this kind of serial exploitation as seamounts were fished out because all the fish were just taken and the fishing fleets would move on to the next seamount and on and on and on and kind of sweeping through across huge areas of the ocean um, until they were pretty much gone and orange ruffy fishing doesn't happen very much now um, partly I think really I mean maybe Christina you could help me with that but I think mainly because they just weren't many left um, but slowly it was realized that this was you know a bad thing to do and despite not just for the fish but for those beautiful corals and these habitats that, that grow on many of these seamounts were being obliterated at the same time so the ecological damage from that kind of fishing was, was really astonishing. And there are various other species on seamounts that are still fished today. Uh, and it's something that we're you know, trying to sort of tackle. Uh, but equally, there's also just a general kind of deepening of fishing because the shallow water fisheries are getting overexploited. And there's this idea that we can find more uh, fish and more protein and so on in the deep ocean. Um, and maybe new ways of exploiting the sea, like um, fishing those twilight zone fishes, um, the lantern fish that are so abundant, and there are people thinking, oh, you know, that's a waste. Maybe we should be we should be fishing those things out. What could we do with them? And they're not very good to eat. Those particular fish, they they're about this. I think they're kind of sardine-y sort of size, but they're full of bones and they're not very tasty. Oh, but we could make them into fish meal and we could feed them to other fish. There we go. That's something we could make some money out of. And so there's plans for that kind of exploitation. Um, so I think there's just get this sort of idea of some people are just looking at the deep and thinking, well, what can we do? How can we make money out of this? Yeah. How can we make money out of it? Um, I mean, not only do you describe uh, the creatures of the deep so beautifully, you've actually able to been able to cross over into my field, which is international law, and actually describe some of the issues that arose uh, in the United Nations back 
1967 that helped to spur the development of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Can you take us back there and what some of the hopes and dreams and um, gold filled uh, lining cups uh, that were pervading yeah. then? Yeah, so this is this dream as well. I think um, I wrote a piece in the, that came out in The Guardian today about this, this enduring, well, it's about the move offshore of various industries. But one idea was that actually we've had this sort of feeling about the deep ocean and the offshore and, and deeper parts of the oceans as being this sort of frontier that's going to produce a, a new exciting um, future for humanity. And it's been going on for decades. This was, you know, 60s and 70s. There've been these dreams of living underwater and and mining the seabed. So this is what was this this idea came up in the 60s um, as people discovered. I mean, we knew about them from before, but it was this new idea that these rocks lying in the bottom of the sea in these great areas of abyssal plains, um, these metallic rocks. Um, well, maybe maybe we could bring them up and use those metals and you know sell them and, and solve all of humanity's problems and it was one individual it was a uh, avid pardo was a maltese representative at the un who who spoke to at the un in, in new york i believe and is it 1967 i think and uh, and said you know i've got this plan uh he gave this great big long kind of two-hour lecture really about how the ocean and these that mining the seabed could really transform humanity we could eat you know it would be an equal world we could all share there's so many of these rocks we could share them all out uh, we'll make so much money, they'll just grow back um, and we'll have well, so many, we won't know what to do with them. And there's nothing else down there apart from rocks and mud. So so let's go get them. Let's get the technologies to do this. We'll share the ability to do this. We'll, we know, we'll, we'll work it all out and everything will be great. And unfortunately, it didn't work out quite that way. Um, very, well, one thing in particular was this idea that these rocks would keep coming back, which they don't. They take millions of years to form. Um, they, they kind of accrete from the water onto little nodules, like little bits of shark tooth and bits and bobs of, of rocks and so on. And they take millions of years to get even the size of like a golf ball. Um, uh, so once they're gone, they're pretty much gone, at least on a human time scale. Um, the technological issues were one reason why I think that first wave of deep sea mining didn't happen. And then there was also the political side of things, which, of course, Christina, you know a, a lot more than I do. But but um, the idea of who owns the deep sea bed was this big question that wasn't at that point settled. And there was this a real kind of grab out beyond the horizon by countries, uh, mostly high, you know, rich countries that had the technologies to do uh, to mine. Uh, the seabed to to drill for oil, that kind of thing, you know, wanted their piece of the seabed. So um, that was what was being worked out at the UN. And that's what led to this big convention that decided who owns or, or who has different rights to different parts of the ocean, drew new boundaries on maps. And I think most exciting for me, and I talk about it in the book, is this idea of the deep seabed out in the high sea, so beyond the jurisdiction of national countries, of, of nations, that that seabed is the common heritage of humanity, that it belongs to all of us now and in the future. I mean, that's, a, that's an extraordinary idea. And it was originally what Avid Pardo was saying was, you know, this should be for all of us. And we have that still, which I think is, is extraordinary. And obviously we're now kind of coming to grips with that. But this idea that it shouldn't be anyone's, you know, claim to whatever it is that's down on the seabed, um, but that, you know, we, we should be sharing this out. And it is something that's, coming back around now with this new interest in now is a new renewed interest in seabed mining so this could be happening soon a lot of things are moving very quickly even since i finished writing the book um of new companies sort of coming up with the technology and with the ambition to to go get these rocks various other parts of the sea they also want to mine sea mounts they want to mine hydrothermal vents but possibly these abyssal rocks will be first um and we're still grappling i believe with this idea of common heritage and, and how do we how do we do that and there's currently not really an answer to that uh, question of of how we look after the seabed and, and who is it for and future generations and all that kind of thing so that's i mean part of what drove me into um deep sea international law was this notion of the common heritage of mankind and the idea that the benefits of the seabed, whether they were economic or non-economic, uh, as in the ecosystem services you've talked about, should be shared by all humankind. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about what is going on now at the International Seabed Authority that is trying to create these regulations to govern the new industry that has uh, many people very concerned? Yeah, absolutely. So there is a, a, extraordinarily a single body that is in charge of the high the seabed under the high sea. So roughly half of the planet is is what we're talking about, and it's this this UN body, the ISA, the International Seabed Authority, who have been um, 
uh, charged with a kind of dual mandate, which is what's kind of causing issues at the moment. On the one hand, they're there to develop the deep sea mining industry, to oversee that, to figure out what to do with this common heritage, to act on behalf of all of, all of humanity and figure this out. But at the same time, to you know, and written into law that Christina, you, we've had long conversations, <laughs> I know, for all sorts of things I've done about of what that means. But that, you know, in various ways, it's written into UN laws that that they must not allow significant harm to the the marine environment through deep through activities on the seabed, including deep sea mining. So at this current point, uh, there's a, a plan to to bring up uh, to write a rule book essentially as to, to determine how deep sea mining could go ahead. And the question is, like, is it going to be possible without causing harm to the environment? Um, because also what we know now, you know, back in Pardo's day, the idea was there was nothing down there, it was just rocks and mud. We know very differently now, um, especially as, you know, ironically, a lot of this science is being done with deep sea mining companies who are taking scientists with them and discovering enormous amounts of biodiversity, um, uh, e e just even in these uh, abyssal plains where there's not a huge biomass of life. It's not like a, a, a hydrothermal vent where it's really obvious that there's a lot of animals and that's a lot of species, but it's still there. A lot of it's hidden, it's small things living inside the rocks associated with the, um, the sediments. There are mobile animals, there are fish, there are um, squid, there are, all sorts of things that that really associate with different aspects of this habitat. So it's, you know, it's much more biologically important. Um, there's also the, the issue of the carbon that's stored and locked away in those sediments as well. That's a big question as to what will happen if we're turning over the seabed with this huge machinery that's uh, being planned to go and collect these rocks. Um, so right now, um, those rules are being developed, but there's um, a possibility, um, possibly even at a meeting in this month, um, at the ISA that could really fast track the whole process. And that's what a lot of people are not happy about. So there's been various things going on, which mean that there is a possibility that within two years, the green light could be given for this industry to go ahead. And a lot of scientists, a lot of conservationists, actually a lot of companies, even uh, just today, we had an announcement, a bunch more companies have come out saying that they, they don't think now is the time for deep sea mining and they're not gonna support the industry or be involved in these metals because we don't know what the impact will be on the biodiversity, on the climate. Um, let alone what those metals are going to be used for. So we're really at an important decision point, you know, a real pivotal moment could be coming up next month. Certainly it's something that's gonna be potentially happening quite a lot faster than a lot of people would like it to um, in terms of um, what I see personally is really industrializing what is one of the least impacted parts of our planet. Um, and even if it starts relatively small, the potential scale of deep sea mining is, is eye-wateringly big in terms of that, the overall impact that it could be having, not just on the seabed, but up through the water column as well. Are these incredible animals we're seeing um, through the open water, other animals that dive down deep. There's so much internet connection between different parts of the ecosystems that could all potentially become contaminated or disturbed by these activities. Um, and I think we know enough to know it could be very scary and very damaging and and not enough yet to know how it could be done without significant harm that uh, may be impossible or virtually impossible to undo on any kind of human time scale. Um, well, so it's a really, I couldn't really have mm -hmm. thought that that was what would be happening when the book came out, to be honest, when I wrote, sort of finished writing it a year and a half ago to think that this is where we are, would be now. And things are moving really quickly, so. Well, yeah. some say that um, you know, if the purpose of the International Seabed Authority is to uh, both develop the, the seafloor and to uh, share in the ben benefits of humankind, what are some of the other benefits that we get from the deep sea that uh, we might actually be able to see translate into both dollars, but also uh, human values and human needs? Yeah, it's a really good question. Again, it's something I try and look at in the book, which is what if we're going to use the deep sea, what should we be using it for? And, and perhaps what would be a more equitable and, and beneficial way of doing so? And there's one really, for me, a really obvious one. Um, and it does, I think, come really head to head with mining because we can't have both. Uh, and that is to, to use um, uh, the deep sea as inspiration for chemical inspiration for new medicines. And that's not just a kind of pie in the sky kind of, oh, you know, maybe we'll find some stuff down there that could be useful. We're actually finding, and scientists are going and looking, taking, now we've got the technology to take very small samples of things like the corals and the sponges that grow on seamounts, that kind of thing. Um, animals that live on hydrothermal vents. There's a bacteria from a hydrothermal vent, which um, creates a, an enzyme, which is actually used 
in research labs all around the world now um, in, a, in a process that's used um, to amplify DNA. It's used for um, tests for COVID, for all sorts of things. And it came from a hydrothermal vent. So if we didn't have those intact habitats, we wouldn't be finding chemicals like that. You know, there are some already being used like that and so many more that are in the pipeline. New antibiotics we desperately need, cancer treatments, malaria treatments. There's just something weird about the chemistry of the deep ocean. It's very <laughs> different down there. It's probably the pressure, probably the fact it's very challenging for life. But, you know, there are there are molecules that are bigger and more potent than anything we find up on land. So if, we really should be looking in the deep and that's what people are doing. Um, and again, the sort of the discovery side of things is very low impact. It doesn't need huge amounts of material. You can literally just take small, small samples now um, very carefully, very specifically using incredible tech, remote diving robots can go down and you're, you're, you're taking just what you need. Then the lab it's all done in the lab after that. And there's no more need to go back to the deep ocean. But what we do need is to, we need to keep those habitats intact. If they're not there, if the species aren't there, then we can't get, be looking for these these chemicals. And it's not just a one-off thing. We wanna be going back. You know, Who knows what questions and problems we need to solve in the future. We need to keep this resource um, for humanity in that way. And um, you know, I really, that's, as I said, it's a genuine benefit that I think is gonna be increasingly important as more of these new chemicals are kind of making their way through that sort of development pipeline of figuring out which ones are gonna be good drugs for this and that. So, you know, I, I genuinely think that's an exciting, we'll be seeing more and more of this coming back up, I think, from the deep. And it's, you know, if we want to we, mine, then that's going to undermine those e ecosystems. So it's it's really one or the other as far as I can, I think, yeah. Mm. And being here, um, where some of us are in Boston and Cambridge, uh, in sort of the biotech and um, hub, that's where, where many are looking into new drugs and new possibilities yeah. to ward off cancer, to ward off COVID, to ward off, um, and to accelerate the search for new antibiotics. I mean, it really yeah. seems to be such a compelling issue. Um, your life seems to have become entwined in the message of this book. Um, how do you keep yourself going uh, now that it has become such a front page issue that was of the, about the future of the deep sea, both the threats from climate change, the threats from potential industrialization? What keeps you going? What keeps you inspired? Oh, it's a good question. I mean, this book was a really tough one to write, so I had to kind of get my through the right self through the writing part of it. Um, it was a huge topic to take on. At times, felt far too big, but I, you know, I got there in the end, and I think that's usually that's been a huge help from the team behind me. And, and I'm I'm very lucky to have a fantastic editor and a team at, at uh, Grove Atlantic in the in, in New York who've just been wonderful in supporting the ideas I had and getting me through the the sort of finishing line on that. And then since it came out, um, yeah, I think. I think what keeps me going now and seeing seeing the swiftness that things are moving on in terms of things like deep sea mining, that's terrifying. But on the other hand, what I'm seeing is a really exciting response and a kind of growing sense of a, a global um, kind of ocean, it's a, it, you know, a swelling of the, the people who are ocean advocates in so many different ways, whether that's companies who are stepping forwards and saying no to deep sea mining or just individuals who are writing to me and saying how shocked they were um, when they read the book and but, ex but you know, but grateful to to now know about what's happening down there and, and also inspired to to do something about it. So I think for me, it's that combination of realizing that now is a really important time. So we have to keep talking and we have to keep pushing those messages out. But equally, there's more people listening and, and wanting to make a difference. And, and that for me, I think keeps me going, yeah. It's um, amazing. Before we switch to the audience questions, can you tell us a little bit about your, your craft? That was the art and craft of writing in such a, an illuminating way, a lively way. Um, how would you sort of convey that um, skill set? and artistry onto the next generation of writers out there, of the young people out there. That's very kind, Christina. Thank you so much for your kind words. You're very kind about my, my writing. And um, I think for me, I mean, it's, I, and I, I was trained as a scientist. I wasn't trained as a, as a writer. So I came to this a little bit later um, in even in realizing this was something I wanted to do. And it, it always, for me, has come from a place of wanting to share my excitement and passion for um, for the oceans and for discovery in science and and my concerns for the ocean. So those sort of dual things were, were behind everything I do, whether it's speaking or writing or whatever, any kind of communication. Um, 
and and I guess in terms of writing specifically, it's really come from uh, learning about myself that I I care a lot about the details of of what's done and what's understood about ecosystems and species in our planet, but wanting to kind of push that through. Um, into prose that is really enjoyable to read and that's smooth and easy to read like i always really strive to make my words and my work not difficult <laughs> so i a lot of people a common com comment i have is oh you know i, I learned so much but i wasn't even realizing it and that's that's exactly what i want to do you know it's like kind of still waters run deep there's a lot down underneath that i've done to try and keep this sort of seeming smooth and easy to kind of come along with me and, and a lot of that is is it's a visual writing. I found that I'm kind of a lot of everything's kind of happening in my mind and I'm sort of playing it out and then I write that down. Um, so that's kind of, from, that's how I write. And maybe, I don't know if that, if, if you know, if there are writers out there who sort of see things in the same way, but that's sort of how I, you know, I, I'm very kind of cinematic in my head and then it sort of comes out onto the page. Yes. And I'm also always looking for kind of fun sides of things too. You know, that there's always little asides. And if there's scenes that I think are kind of, you know, I'm not trying to be funny, but there are humorous I sort of and sort of charming aspects, I suppose, to the things that we're looking at. And I love to look for those as well and kind of pull out some of the funnier things, too, that are going on. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess it's and a lot of hard work. I've worked incredibly hard. I continue to work incredibly hard on being better as a prose writer. It's not something that I just did. <laughs> overnight. I mean, it was it has been a lot of self-taught teaching, a lot of reading, um, a lot of reading other people's work, a lot of asking for feedback and always taking that very seriously from other people, too, um, and just always trying to do better. So, you know, it's a it's a craft. Yeah, you, you have to work at it. And I think if you do, you will. Um, you'll reap those rewards and, and get better as you're sort of finding your voice on the page. And I do feel like this is the book that I've really uh, found that voice much more yeah. strongly, I think, than any of my other books. I felt like I was a lot more brave <laughs> than I have been and I really got off the fence. <laughs> Indeed, too. you are very brave. Do you have one small smidgen of a quote that you would like to oh. share with us? Oh, sure. Yeah, I was going to read you this little bit, which actually captures the kind of funny side of things, too, which is about Yeti crabs, which are related to those hop crabs I showed you earlier. So when Yeti crabs were discovered, it would have been poetic if they were found to eat marine snow. In fact, they do something even stranger. These abominable crustaceans were first seen in 2005 during a deep sea research cruise in the eastern Pacific, south of Easter Island. They're pale coloured with a thumb sized body and long front claws covered in luxuriant bristly extensions of their shells called CETA. Tipped with a goofy, uh, a pair of goofy looking rounded pincers, these blonde pelts of fur look like, give the animal the look of a deep sea crab that might appear on the Muppet show. <laughs> <laughs> the Muppet crab. <laughs> I love it, I love it. That was, um, and I, I'm seeing some other questions coming through and um, my always favorite question is, what is your favorite creature? Um, can you tell us some more about some of these crazy creatures you're seeing? Oh, a favorite creature. It's a great question and one I find very difficult to answer because there's so many to choose from. So I generally have like a creature of the week or a month or whatever I'm kind of thinking of. Um, and actually, one, one that's been on my mind recently because some other things that have, uh, another project I might be able to share with you, but not not today, but maybe soon, um, is Ossidax. I write about it in the book, these weird bone eating worms. They don't look great. They are weird. They look like little plants with green roots and feathery red feathers, but they were completely unknown to science until um, about 2000, I think, when they were accidentally, a, a whale skeleton was accidentally found in the deep ocean. And I love that, um, uh, that kind of serendipity of deep sea research too. As much as we look and kind of have this under idea of what we're going to go find there, there's always that element of, oh, what's that? No one was expecting that. <laughs> and then these, this whole group of worms that have these incredibly cool biology just um, to, they eat bones. They, you know, that's what they do down in the deep ocean, and it's a pretty crazy lifestyle for them to lead. So they're one of my favorites, definitely. <laughs> well, your book is filled with favorite animals. Uh, each page, you sort of look and say, "Oh, that's fascinating. Oh, I want to know more <laughs> about this and that." Uh, that's uh, so. It is truly a, a joy to read. I see Lauren has joined us, and I think she has some burning questions for herself as well as from the audience. Uh, so we're going to take turns here. Please, Lauren, go <laughs> ahead. Sorry, I didn't realize I was still muted. Okay, so we've got a question from Jeff who is asking, you mentioned how massive the ocean is and how hard it is to distill it into something book size. How did you decide what to focus on and by extension, what not to include? 
a really good question and that's what i really struggled with i think it's one of the reasons why um i kind of uh ground to a halt occasionally when i was writing i think in, in everything i do with my writing it's um I do a lot of reading and I spread myself incredibly wide to begin with. And that's the part where I get completely overwhelmed and think, what am I doing? And then I look for the story that leads through. And, and it's there's, there's so many ways you could tell it. There's no one true right way of doing it. But slowly I kind of piece it together between the stories of, in this case, it was a lot of the animals I wanted to talk about. So the first half is really kind of the ecosystems and the animals. And so I was picking out my favorite. So yeah, it was a book of my favorite species, the Ossidax, the Yeti crabs, um, the beautiful jelly creatures, those gossamer worms. And I kind of used those as stepping stones really to go between. And, and it told me which ecosystems I really wanted to focus on and which kind of aspects of the deep um, would kind of lead me through. Knowing full well, and that's what it was so hard, knowing full well there was so much I was missing on the way, but I guess you just have to have confidence that you know you the point I, a book about the whole of the deep would be so big and so laborious that you you know that that was sort of misses the point um this is just my version of what i you know how i kind of went on this journey through the deep um and then the the second half of the book is much more about human uses and values of the deep and that for me as well was kind of dictated by those those key points i wanted to talk about so pollution and fishing and deep sea mining for me were the key things and so that was how that kind of got structured as well so by the end of it and, and always with my books i get to the end and i look back and i go oh right yeah that's what the book was about i go i set out with an idea and i go along those you know that way but it always ends up being different and i only really know by the end what it's about um exactly so yeah it's like a massive sculpture job that was you revealing what is inside the inner core uh, the end of your book ends with the chapter, A Sanctuary in the Deep. A question that a, a lot of the audience is asking is, what can we do as private citizens, both about climate change and about sort of the incipient industrialization of the deep sea? What can be done? It's a really good idea. I mean, in the book, you, um, you know, if you've read it or if you feel you'd like to, then, then please do. And I, I do really like that end part. It's the, it's the kind of that's a bit where I climb right off the fence and I say, what we need to do is protect the deep completely from exploitation. Um, that's obviously a huge ask and there's a lot that's gonna need to go into that. But there is thing we, there's a lot we can do as individuals as well. Um, you know, whether it's um, supporting uh, the companies um, that are currently uh, standing up against deep sea mining, for example. Um, and just today, as I say, I think it was Patagonia and Volkswagen and various others, um, that have, have joined up uh, joined this call for moratorium on deep sea mining so if, if there are brands that are that are making those claims and they're within uh, some you know if, if you're looking at buying a car or whatever it might be if there are companies that that fit that that um that model of you know really standing up for the deep then you know support them um equally uh you know beyond sort of buying and and consuming we can be thinking about you know, exactly how we're using our own resources and, and really push for um um, for, for the circularity of, uh, of reusing and fixing and not just going out and buying the next new phone when you when you want one, we can all be part of that, pushing for a better society where by we really value the resources that we have rather than just looking for new sources and going to places like the deep ocean when we've run out of stuff on land. Um, so thinking, you know, being a part of that as individuals, you know, there, we, we can be kind of pushing together in, in this direction towards making this big change that needs to happen. And equally, you know, seek out your representatives who are, who are again, who are push, pulling, you know, uh, helping anything to do with the oceans, who are fighting to protect the oceans in any way. Because again, another big strong message in my book is to look after the deep sea, we, we need to look after the, the shallow seas. We need the, the whole thing is connected. If we can figure out sustainable fishing in the shallow seas, if we can figure out where we're getting our resources from um, on land and in shallow seas, we don't even need to go to the deep ocean. So it, it, it kind of negates that need to even look to that space. So whatever we can do, join advocacy groups that are doing anything uh, for the ocean in whatever way it is, and it will be playing a part in this bigger picture of what's happening in the deep ocean too so join join whichever group you can find that you feel there are people who who you know share your views on the ocean um you know vote put your money where your mouth is um, all those things will i think really help i really do that's i would just add um the deep ocean stewardship initiative that yes. um 
I'm involved in with Diva Ammon and Lisa Levin and a lot of amazing, and Jeff Marlowe, uh, a lot of amazing deep ocean scientists welcomes people with uh, some type of policy expertise that can be applied to the deep ocean. So this is a, a way for individuals to get involved in sharing their knowledge and sharing their analytical skills. Uh, but there are also organizations like the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition that are showing Deep Week this week. That's where yeah. they have lots of informational um, videos, discussions, chats. Uh, and um, you know, I think it's important in you know, sort of the academia, the, the mix of science and um, policy and caring to keep that sense of humor. And I think that's something that you do so beautifully and also the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, their Deep Week um, does quite well. So, you know, have a good time, work with good people, but yeah, sort of allocate that passion that you, you have as you are doing, as many other people are doing to something that um, is a worthy cause. So that's really exciting. Lauren, over to you for the next. Yes, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we have another attendee who's asking, does it matter that the United States is not a party of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea? What are the implications of this positive or negative? I feel like this is definitely a question for Christina. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the, the simple answer is both. Um, that was the United States should be at the table where they are discussing at the International Seabed Authority these rules that could literally launch a new industry for the next half century. That was um, many are saying we uh, need to go green and to go green, we need to harvest the, or we need to extract and exploit the minerals of the deep sea. The US is also um, capable of great strategic planning, uh, understanding of what it will take to clean up mining on land before we actually have to go to these new resources or to stimulate new, um, industries for recycling, reducing, uh, reusing. And also the US is a, a land of great innovation. Many other countries are a land of great in innovation, but we can be creating ways, new types of batteries that don't require these high levels of cobalt to run our electric vehicles. Um, so it would be wonderful that we have the United States at the table uh, right now, uh, there is great concern in equity, environmental protection and climate change. And how do you marry all of those things with being outside the room when many of these important discussions are being made? Um, at the same time, we're not missing out on any great exploitation. It's going to take a long time, I think, for the uh, International Seabed Authority to actually develop these rules that they say they're in a very big hurry to develop. That's, so we'll hope they do um, join eventually. I think it's really yeah. important. Yeah, no, that's a brilliant answer. Thank you. Um, and I was going to just add as well in the previous question about what we can all do. Of course, what's really important too, which I didn't say, is um, it's just knowing um, and being interested in the deep ocean and making that just a thing that is more just bring people into that. Talk to your family, talk to your friends, talk to anyone who will listen, yeah, educate yourself, find out, be interested, because that in itself has a huge power. And I think that could spread, especially at the moment. There's, we're really in a moment where these ideas about the planet are spreading. And I think the deep ocean needs to be a bigger part of those discussions too. And, and you can all be part of that, so. Yes. Great. I think we have time for one more question. I'm just gonna jump in here with this. What is the technology that allows us to map the deep ocean and how do you see it developing in the next 20 years? Which geographic parts of the deep ocean are in the greatest peril? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a big question. I, I'll try and answer a few parts of that. Um, we have amazing technologies. I mean, I really think we're in a golden age of um, scientific discoveries and research in the deep ocean, not just looking for species and cool things, but really understanding how it all works physically, uh, um, chemically, biologically, how this whole enormous interconnected ecosystem is functioning. Um, we have everything um, in terms of just simply mapping the deep. There's an interesting project going on right now called um, Seabed 2030, I think it's called. And the idea is to map the entirety of the deep ocean to a, to a degree um, by the year 2030. I believe they've just passed the 20% mark. And there's a certain sort of area they want like one depth measure, measurement of something like 800 meter pixels. So even that's a fairly coarse map, but it will be the best we have of the entire the entirety of the seabed um, because it is a really huge um, area. We talk about how we know more about the surface of the moon than the deep ocean, whereas actually that's kind of unfair. Firstly, there's no water in the way from the moon, so you can easily see it. And secondly, the deep ocean is 10 times bigger than the moon. So 
um, you know, there's a lot more to be looking at. <laughs> so, but it's very important for finding things like deep sea mounts and, you know, understanding the physical shapes of the seabed is going to help us understand more about what's down there. Um, I do see that developing, you know, that project actually is using all sorts of different technologies to do those um, depth soundings. But we are seeing so many exciting remote technologies online, you kind know, of, um, monitoring equipment that's being put permanently in the deep or at least for a long time it's just constantly filming and monitoring what's down there as well as um sort of robot robots that are sent off to sort of swim around on their own i think we're going to see a lot more of these kind of autonomous um developments i think genetic sequencing is going to become even more um fast and more exciting in the deep ocean we're going to i hope see more of just sort of understanding um those levels of uh, you know the, d how ecosystems are working through those sorts of technologies and in terms of which geographic parts are the greatest peril i, I don't know if christina if you have any thoughts on that too i guess it really depends partly on whether seabed mining takes off if it does one big area where they're planning to do that is in the middle of the pacific in this area called the clarion clipperton zone which is kind of um between hawaii and and mexico um so that could be where things really kick off um equally there are places where people want to mine hydrothermal vents um in the indian ocean and various other places and um seamounts and things so i would say the kind of the future of the ocean really hangs in the balance in terms of whether the mining takes off and whenever that does happen um otherwise i guess it's a fairly yeah there's there's pollutants in various parts of the ocean there's fishing in various parts of the ocean it's it's a huge huge space i don't know if there's any other hot spots you can think of christina or whether i've kind of <laughs> nailed it with the the mining question well i'd say um colleagues uh like matt gianni the deep sea conservation coalition have helped spur the united nations to develop laws that actually say for deep sea bottom fishing that you need to assess what the potential impacts of bottom fishing could be. And you need to be able to show that you can bottom fish in a way that doesn't hit the bottom and that your take would actually be sustainable. Um, the, the trick is we don't have rules like that in place yet for seabed mining, even though the law of the sea convention could um, adapt and enfold that type of interpretation. So it's it's a question of how precautionary we as a people decide we want to be. We have many different futures um, that are unfolding before us and sort of now the, the choices are starting to run out, but they're still there. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think I'll just add one point, which is this year is the, um, I think it's the 60th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty coming into force. And I know, because, you know, we've had conversations about this too, and how, you know, extraordinary that was as a treaty that, um, um, again, humanity kind of got together and put aside their ideas of how useful that continent could be for strategic purposes and for, for um, mining resources. And, and it was set aside just for peace and science. Um, you know, and it would be my dream, and uh, maybe it's yeah a dream, but a dream that we could do the same for the deep ocean and maybe even for the high seas and say, hey, you know, let's just do the same thing. We did it with Antarctica. Um, hopefully that can say stay, stay strong. And there was some real interest in mining Antarctica. I know we've we've talked about that too, and how um, you know that again was set aside, and people said, right, we we won't do that. Um, we could do the same for the deep sea, maybe. I mean, why not? Why can't we make that progressive? Um, statement for the planet now that we know how important it is and uh, and how much in danger it could be so what hmm. we could do it as we're realizing how much we have to come together as a planet to solve the crisis of climate change uh, we also need to be able to come together as a planet to solve the crisis of ocean change um, so thank you so much for expressing the the world of the deep the world without light the world that has its own light so and indescribably beautifully. Thank you. And thank you to Harvard Bookstore. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for being here and for your great questions. Yes, thank you so much, Helen and Christina, for sharing your expertise with us. This was absolutely fascinating. Please do check out The Brilliant Anthus. I dropped the link in the chat, but you can also go directly to harvard.com to purchase a copy. I highly recommend you do. And from all of us here at Harvard Bookstore, Harvard University Division of Science and the Harvard Library here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a great night. Keep reading and happy holidays. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye.